and so we're not going through sequentially we're not going through like a class we're going through to see what the Lord wants to say to us because the book of Revelation says listen to what the Lord is saying to the churches that says over it's over and over in this book so let's listen to what the Lord has to say to us just a little historical background there are seven churches to which the book was written the book has been attributed to a man named John that may well have been the John that wrote the Gospels here's the problem the New Testament is full of a whole bunch of Mary's and a whole bunch of John's yeah it was a popular name back then for babies just kind of like now my son Lars he had like four or five Caitlin's in every class growing up because that was the name at the time so we've got names like John and Mary we're not sure if this is another John or the same one could well be the same one probably is but we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us but he was on the island of Patmos Patmos is a little island in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Asia now you might think Asia isn't that where China and India and Japan are the Romans called Western Turkey Asia that's where we got the name Asia for that continent we looked towards the east and everything east in their mind including China India and Turkey was Asia that was the great beyond that was everything east of there and so basically he's writing to seven churches in Eastern excuse me Western Turkey and you can see those on the map right there you can see where it is compared to Jerusalem so John is on Patmos writing to seven churches none of whom exist anymore the area about half a millennium ago was taken over by the Muslims now Turks live there not Greeks and they're Muslims so there are these churches are no longer there but this is written to the churches about things that were going on at the time that were very important to them and also with us here's a passion of mine these are two Greek words which nobody knows but are super important and I am willing to die on this hill anytime two ways to look at the Bible these are Greek words exegesis and eisegesis now you might say I don't need to know this yes you do here's why exegesis is bringing out what the Bible has to say eisegesis is imposing our theology and our systems on the Bible and interpreting it that way if you have a very strong ideology or theology the temptation is going to be to impose things on the Bible let's say you're a Calvinist or a Lutheran or whatever you happen to be the tendency is to use what we call confirmation bias to look for the things we like and to leave out the things we don't I don't think it's a very healthy way of looking at the Bible because I think God put things in the Bible for a reason and we ought to let the Bible speak for itself whenever possible in other words when we study the Bible try to find out what the book of Revelation in this case is actually saying and what it's not for instance a lot of people think there's an Antichrist in the book of Revelation you can search the book the word doesn't appear people think well the rapture happens in the book of Revelation you can search the book it doesn't appear we impose things on books because of a theology or because of a system we have and I think it's so important to let the Bible speak for itself and let the message come out it's harder work by the way because I would like to just confirm my biases in the Bible and read those Bible verses I like and leave out the ones I don't who thinks it's healthier to look at the whole thing as it is and get wisdom out of it I grow more when I get challenged by things I don't agree with than by things I do I grow more when I struggle than when I have comfort in life people I've said this so many times people say oh the Bible comforts me all the time I'm thinking what Bible are you reading the Bible challenges us over and over and over and challenges my ideology and my opinions and I think that's healthy as we get older and we're all getting older at the same rate we start out as grape juice I say this all the time we can become fine wine or we can become vinegar over time it's it's really up to you and I would really rather continue to grow as a person as I get older who loves sweet old people I do who 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 hates it when mr. Wilson from the Dennis the menace thing shows up the crabby old person yeah we don't want to become mr. Wilson we want to become that wise old you know Yoda type person 
Let's look at the book of Revelation itself. Take your Bibles or your phones or whatever, and Phil, could you pass out some Bibles? Oh, they're already passed out. Never mind. Revelation 1, 1 through 11. Let's see what the Bible itself has to say to us. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay, there's two ways to learn things. One is by using our physical senses. You can see all the people in the room right now. If you turn your head around, look around, you can see who's here. You can hear the airplane flying by. You might hear the guy start up his power tools again, at which we'll have somebody go out and talk to him. We feel a little chilly or a little warm depending on where we're sitting in the room and depending on our body fat level. You know, some of us get cold all the time. And you know who you are, you're freezing all the time. And so, you know, it's uh, just eat more, you'll, feel, you'll be happier. We have our five senses and we bring stuff in or we read or we learn or we go to school that's using our five senses. And to do that very precisely is called science. In other words, we write down what we sense and we ask other people to check it out and we figure stuff out. That's one way to learn things. The other way is through God revealing things to us, through promptings that he gives us. And you might say, how can I discern the promptings I get from my inner gut feelings? Well, what I do is I watch for those promptings that don't line up with what my normal druthers are, those promptings that challenge me. When I'm driving on the 405 by the Westminster exit, in and out is there. And I have an inner voice that says, now, exit, now, go, go, go. You've got the money, you can do this, go, go, go get a four by four, now, uh, get it. That's not the Lord, that's just an inner voice. <laughs> but when I hear a voice saying, you know, you really ought to call that person you don't want to talk to, that's the Lord. Don't you, don't you hate that when it shows up? When it's not in line with your normal gut, pay attention to it. We can learn things through our five senses or through listening to God and being receptive to God. Now, we're all singing about Jesus coming soon, and they did a great job singing about that. And we always want God to show up and fix everybody else. But we don't want to be open to the Lord showing up for us sometimes. The Bible is a great book, and there's a lot of spirituality in the book, but you can sum it up in one word, the spirituality, receptivity. How receptive are you to the Lord? How receptive are you to his voice, his grace, his forgiveness, his joy, his, his guidance? It's all free, folks. The key is how receptive are we? I've said this so many times, but God has more talk than we have listen. I don't hear from God. Well, that's because your life is full of noise and you're not listening. Sit down and listen to God. God, all, We're in the presence of a God who speaks, not just in the Bible, but now. And by the way, he speaks through the Bible too, if you're reading it. So we need to pay attention to those things. This is a revelation, a revealing from Jesus Christ. This is not something John got through his senses. This was a revelation, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. The word soon, folks, he wasn't mistaken about that. He's talking about things happening to these seven churches, which existed then, and he's telling them what they need to do to get through what's going on, and what's going on is persecution big-time persecution, life-threatening persecution. The Romans didn't like Christians, and there were waves of persecution. We don't know which persecution this was, because he doesn't tell us. But there were two of them in the first century which were nasty, where they used to put Christians on poles and light them up as torches for their parties. Seriously. Where they would just have a feast there with Christians lighting the way. So this is what they were facing. You know, there's no church buildings during this era because people didn't want to build a church building because people would just blow it up. They didn't have TNT back then. They'd just do something. But they would come after the people. That's why they said, are you sure you want to get baptized? Are you sure you want to be one of us? Because, you know, hey, things can happen to you. So he sent an angel 
to present this revelation to his servant John. Angel is the same word in Greek for messenger, so it could just be a messenger, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Matt back here works for the LA Times in our prayer meeting. He says, that's the part that meant the most to me because there's a report. But anyways, God blesses the one, verse three, who reads the words of this prophecy. Prophecy, please hear me. Prophecy is the Greek word prophemi, speak forth. It's not fortune telling, it's forth telling. How do prophets start their every, Every paragraph of the Old Testament where a prophet talks, what do they say? Thus says the Lord. Prophecy is available now. That's why at our meetings we listen for God to prophetically speak to us. Prophecy is God's spirit speaking to our spirit and us speaking it forth or writing it down. God almost never spoke in an audible voice throughout the whole Bible. He spoke spiritually to people and they wrote it down just like he does now. Prophecy happened then, prophecy happens now, and it's not fortune telling. It has future ramifications and it has a future application, but it's not primarily fortune telling. People often say, well, is there a prophecy that predicts? And I'm thinking, that's not the point of prophecy. The point of prophecy is God speaks to us all the time. He's broadcasting 24 seven. You can hold your hand up and every radio station within range is sending radio waves through your hand. If you had a set here, you'd pick it up. It's hard to believe that those things go through everything, but they do. You can close up your house and the radio waves come right in. God is speaking all the time. And this is a prophetic word he has for the churches. And he blesses all who listen to this message. There is a blessing to listening to prophecy, to God speaking forth. And that blessing is something we're going to get as a congregation. And obey what it says, for the time is near. And a lot of people ignore that. Oh, he really meant a long time in the future. No, the time for them is near. The time for us is near. The time is always right around the corner. The present is always the only thing we ever have. The future and the past only exist as constructs in our mind. You could be Bill, Great, Bill Gates, Elon Musk rich, and you couldn't go to either one no matter what the technology is, all that really exists is now. And what is, and God is moving into our present reality all the time, moving into theirs, moving into ours. When we ask the Lord to come, I hope our hearts are open to him actually showing up in our lives and not just showing up and fixing the things in the world we don't like. Verse four, this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and is still to come. For the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to, those, to these things. The first to rise from the dead, remember this is preparing for Easter, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He's made us a kingdom. We're going to come back to that word kingdom over and over in this passage of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with clouds of heaven. Here's something we often misunderstand. Clouds to Jewish people were not something up in the sky. Who saw dramatic clouds yesterday? They were everywhere. It was really cool to look at. We think when he, we say coming in the clouds, we think of Jesus descending like the dragon space capsule or something and parachutes coming out and just coming down to us out of space as if, as if God is in some space capsule somewhere and he's coming down to us. Folks, to the Hebrews, the clouds were the Shekinah glory of God and they showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They filled the temple when, when God's spirit filled the temple when it was built. And it's a symbol for God's mysterious presence. In fact, if you go to the South and you go to a Pentecostal church, they'll talk about Shekinah glory. You know, that, the, the Shekinah is God emerged. Jesus comes out of that spiritual zone have you ever been in a real spiritual mode? There's a, there's a misty, cloudy kind of feel to it. It's, it's not something we see with our senses, but when you describe it to other people, that's how it comes across. I hear from you guys all the time. Pastor, I don't want you to think I'm weird, but most of you have said that to me at one time or another. I don't want you to think I'm weird, but 
I saw this, or this, uh, this person came and helped me, all of a sudden he disappeared, you know, stuff like that. It, it's very common that we have these experiences which we can't explain. And they're kind of cloudy in a good sense. He's coming in the clouds of heaven, and heaven is shemayim, or the shimmering of water, that's the Hebrew word, that's that, that, that zone. He doesn't come from some... We could travel all through space. You're not going to find a place called heaven that's like a planet. It's the force behind everything. The kingdom of heaven is God's rule of the entire universe, and it's spiritual. It lights up your consciousness, by the way, right now. And you share a lot with him. You're able to create. You're able to love. You're able to do all the kind of things that God does in that sense. You can put your hands on people and pray for, guess what? Healing. And God's kingdom power can flow through you. So this is not talking about God coming in some, in some spaceship to land here and fix things. It's God appearing, Lord Jesus, come quickly, come into our lives and fix us so we can with you fix everything. Does that make sense? So here's what we're looking at. And this is why the book is re relevant for us now, as it was for them. Oh, I went back. To, I went too fast. I'm getting too excited comes the clouds of heaven, the Shekinah glory, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the two, those are not strains of the, uh, the, the virus. Uh, alpha and Omega are the two letters of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end. Omega just means big O. Omicron, by the way, micron, little O, little O, Omicron, Omega, big O nerd stuff. Anyways, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I'm the one who is, who always was, and still to come, the Almighty One. I, John, am brother and kingdom in the suffering and in God's what? Here comes kingdom again. In Hebrew, the Malkuth, and the Malkuth is the center of Jesus' teaching. It's, it's the power behind everything that we have access to. This is why I love spirit-filled Christians. You might think some of their churches, you know, they're a little bit, you know, out there. They get this at a gut level. They get the sense that God's power is available now. And there's something beautiful about that, that we have access to that. That's Jesus' primary teaching, that this kingdom powers. How does he start all his parables? The kingdom is like this. This is how this is how God's power works in the world, and this is how you have access to it. And he would send out the 12 and send out the 70 and say, go do the kingdom stuff. Tell them the kingdom is coming and do these things. And he'd just stay home and hang out because he needed a break. I don't, he didn't go with them. People, Jesus didn't do miracles to show off. He did miracles to show us how to do miracles. Do you understand the difference? He's a teacher. We can operate in the miraculous. Human beings are incredible in their spiritual potential. One person can make a huge difference in the world if he or she is filled with the Spirit and doing what God wants us to do. Huge difference. You can make a huge difference. God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Why did they ex... People, they exile people that they don't want to kill because they don't want to make them a martyr. I guarantee you the Russians don't want to kill the leader of Ukraine right now because he's good looking and he'd be a great martyr. It, really, he would. He's, he's articulate and everything else. And if they could make him this, they'll capture him, they'll put him somewhere, but they will not kill him except by me by accident. I don't know, but they're not going to because he's exiled, which means he's important. So he probably was the John from the Gospels. Number 10, here's another thing we misunderstand. Here's something interesting. What day are we meeting on? We don't know why. We don't know why. That's, we're, that's lost to history. The Jews worshiped on Saturday. All of a sudden, Christians worship on Sunday. And everyone's got a theory, but nobody's got any evidence or proof. It shifted at one point or another. People say, the Lord's Day, well, that must have been Sunday. Does it say that? No, it doesn't. To Hebrews... The day of the Lord is all over the Old Testament. And it wasn't Sunday. In Hebrew, Bayom Hahu, that day, the big day. And it was the big day that is coming that 
the, the evil rulers of this world are going to get what's coming to them. The day of the Lord is coming against the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and it always did come. And the oppressor always died. And that's what the prophets of the Old Testament would say. Watch out, the day of the Lord is coming. Bayom hahu, that day. It's, coming after, it's going to come after these people. He's saying on the Lord's day, he's bringing out the imagery of these Roman oppressors are going to die. They're going to die, and we're going to, we're going to survive. Was there any evidence of that back then? Not scientifically. Christians were a little minority in a big empire that had a lot of guns, not guns, swords, and a lot of power. A lot of power. And the power differential looked like they could squash people, but they didn't. There's no Roman Empire left, and there's Christians all over the place. Because John was right, because God was right when he told him this. You guys are the survivors. You can take this to the bank, people. God always blesses the faithful remnant. You might think you're outnumbered. You might think nobody else thinks this stuff. You might think the whole world's going a different direction, but God always blesses the faithful remnant. Always, always, always. And that's what John is saying here. Be the faithful remnant, and you're going to get through this. Some of you may die, and he says that, but it's worth it. Stick to the truth as best as you know it. So on that day, the day of the Lord, might have been a Sunday, but really it was the big day where they're going to get theirs. I was worshiping in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, excuse me, Smyrma, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. That's the beginning of the book. And it tells us who he's writing to. Who's he writing to? The seven churches. They're meeting in homes. Every one of them was smaller than this church. You can't fit this many people in someone's living room. These are little churches, and he's telling them, you guys are going to outlast the Romans, and you guys are going to make it, and they're not. Did that sound logical? No, it didn't. But it turned out to be true? Yes, it did. It did turn out to be true because the Lord did show up and the Lord did protect them and the Lord got them through it. The Lord often doesn't get us, doesn't take away persecution, but he gets us through it. I was at a prayer meeting with a bunch of Africans once, not African-Americans, African-Africans. And somebody said in the prayer meeting, Lord, take away the persecution of the churches in northern Nigeria. And one of the Africans stood up and says, don't you dare pray that. Whoa. Pray that we have the strength to get through it. Don't pray that this ends. Pray that we are going to prevail. Because we're going to prevail, by the way. And my money's on them. Because <laughs> they're the faithful remnant. People, being the faithful remnant is always a good bet. No matter what the culture is telling us. Who thinks the culture has different things to tell us right now? Every TV show we watch, every news, everything. And we think, this is, you know, we have no chance. Yes, we do. This book is telling us we have a chance. How to approach the Bible. You have here on the screen a picture of ugly Americans. These, these, these are not any of you, I'm sure, when you're traveling abroad. But you can see them in two minutes when you're traveling abroad. When I lived in Europe for a year with Wendy, my son was born there, occasionally I'd run into Americans. And you could see, they'd come up to me. And they'd be you know, dressed like Americans, acting like Americans. Do you speak English? And I'd say, a little. It was, it was, it was kind of fun. <laughs> but you could spot them. You could just spot them. It was just, uh, not all American tourists are like this, but some tourists are, oh, I don't like this country, France. Where can I find a Walmart? You know, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's bad. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got about reading the Bible, how to read the Bible, is don't be an ugly American in the Bible. Don't bring your cultural presuppositions into the book. Let, you'll learn more if you eat what they eat, do what they do, and pay attention to what's going on. Try to speak the language a little bit. We learn a lot more from the Bible the less we bring into it. Jesus, when he sent them out two by two, says, don't bring a bunch of stuff with you. Be willing to learn from the people that you're evangelizing. Be willing to eat what they give you. Don't bring all of your own baggage and stuff with you when you go. 
That's how we approach the Bible. So we shouldn't add anything to the book of Revelation. So be suspicious when people say, oh, Gog and Magog, that means Russia. Oh, really? Does it say that? No. Could it be? Sure, well, whatever. But what I'm saying is that people bring stuff into the Bible all the time, and they act like it's for sure. And you just can't do that to the Bible. That's being an ugly American. Ask the, ask the Lord to show us what's actually in there. And here's a little warning in case you don't take me seriously. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what's written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in that book. That's what happened when we, when we eisegete, when we bring stuff into the Bible. There's a warning here, don't do that to this book, and yet people do it all the time. I see these books, this is what the book of Revelation really means, and they add all of this stuff. I'm thinking, you're bringing the curses down on your, don't do that. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and the holy city they're describing in this book. That's kind of serious. That's a big warning label. That's worse than the ones on the cigarette packages. This is, this is pretty serious stuff, eternal stuff. So, I want to help you understand this book. And the way to do that is to treat the book the way it's written. A genre, G-E-N-R-E. If you ever took a literature class, there's different genres of literature. Who thinks that poetry is different than history writing? Or music lyrics are different than scientific journals? There's lots of different, there's proverbs in the Bible, there's music, the book of Psalms. There's history. First few books of the Bible are all history. Book of Acts is history. There are Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are letters. Who thinks that letters that you write are different than papers you write for a professor? Paul writes a lot of letters. Here is one form of literature, one genre, which has only been used in America once. And it's, it's called apocalyptic. And apocalyptic doesn't mean really bad. I use it that way. I'll say, I've been cheering for the Vikings for all these years, and this season was apocalyptic. But this, by the way, is a Viking Super Bowl ring. I'm a long-suffering person here, as far as that goes. Apocalyptic literature is a special kind of literature that comes out of pain. And I mean real pain. I mean, I'm talking... I'm talking childbirth slash got stung by a stingray slash all together. Uh, it takes serious cultural pain to produce apocalyptic. Nobody sits down and says, I'm having a great, great vacation. I'm going to write some apocalyptic. Nobody does that. Apocalyptic literature, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. Jesus goes apocalyptic at the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Apocalyptic literature is the way we express incredible pain with hope in the middle of it. And the book of Daniel is all about that, and the book of Revelation is all about that, and Jesus, when he goes apocalyptic in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is all about that. And let me explain to you the kind of pain that they deal with. It's deeply symbolic language. One of us in the prayer meeting, remember who it was, Stan said, this is really visual. Was that you or I don't know who it was, but we talked about how this book is so visual. You can read all the letters of Paul and there's nothing visual in there. He's an audio learner. You can tell Paul's an audio guy. He probably has a messy room and doesn't notice. You look at John and he's got this visual stuff going. It's just, it's fireworks visual. And apocalyptic literature is heavily symbolic and potent. And it carries two things, pain and hope. And the pain is real. And all of the apocalyptic literature of the Bible is centered around two dates, the destruction of the first temple and the destruction of the second temple, which people saw as the place where heaven and earth come together. And once you destroy the temple, who are we as a people? What, what, it was awful. The Romans in 70 AD raised the city, didn't leave one stone on top of the other, and just sent the Jews everywhere in the world. To this day, they're still scattered all over the place. That was apocalyptic in that sense. It was, 
These two painful things, the book of Daniel, 587 BC, comes out of that period of the destruction of the first temple. And all of the pain that went into the captivity and the book of Revelation is focused around all the pain around 70 AD and all the stuff that came out of that. People go apocalyptic when things are extremely painful. When people of faith go through pain, they go apocalyptic. And you're going to see where this happened once in America's history. Only once. Here's some words I'd like you to write down and pay attention to. Apocalyptic literature has three parts. Denoting, connoting, and hope. When John talks about Babylon, he's talking about Rome. There's seven hills there, and the Babylonians are gone. They're not, they're not persecuting the Christians. They're using symbolic language to denote things that are happening right then. Right then. Everybody reading the book of Revelation would know what all these symbols meant. We don't know anymore because we're not living that kind of thing. We don't know exactly who he's talking about. We can pretend like we do, but we don't but everyone reading the book knew. And so denoting, connoting, and apocalyptic, I get ahead of myself, apocalyptic literature, say that three times fast, denotes something happening in the time of writing. Connotation is it connotes a spiritual reality which is eternal, which is still valid for us. And they're all, there's no such thing as apocalyptic literature without hope. There's always hope involved in that. So, denoting, connoting, hope. Are you curious when this happened in America? Well, I'll show you. It happened during the Civil War. Read the hymns in the Civil War that came out of the Civil War. It's all apocalyptic. America went apocalyptic during the Civil War. Why? Incredible pain. Our country had 30 million people. We now have 330 million people. Ten times, the country is one-tenth the size. We lost 600, whew, and 55,000 men. We think of Afghanistan and the Gulf War being terrible. We lost 6.8 thousand. Every one of those lives is important. But do you see this is like a hundred-fold difference? That's a big deal. We didn't go apocalyptic during Iraq and Afghanistan because it wasn't bad enough. The Civil War, it was bad enough. People say, America's never been more divided than right now. Are they kidding? Taking up arms against each other and slaughtering each other by the tens of thousands? Wendy and I went to Vicksburg. Whew. <laughs> Nasty stuff. Bloodbath. And America went apocalyptic. Let's read this out loud. This comes right out of the Civil War. One, two, three. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming. He is tramp vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faith. It's terrible, swift sore. His truth is marching on. He is sound forth. He's speaking out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Be swift. America went full on apocalyptic. Incredible pain. But a person of hope wrote this. <laughs> We've been there. And people are going through it right now in the world. We see it on the, you saw it on the news this morning. I guarantee you there's poets in Ukraine going apocalyptic right now, especially people of faith. And it's continuing to happen. So what do we do when we face these things? John 16, 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on this earth you will face many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. This is what faithful people do in the face of this stuff. We don't run and hide. We don't give up. We don't roll over and play dead. We resist, hang on to the truth, and we come into solidarity with people who are going through it. Who thinks there's people in the world going through nasty stuff right now? They are. 
And what are you facing? Vocational uncertainty, virtually everybody is right now. The days of somebody working 30, 40 years for one company and getting a gold watch and a nice retirement are over. People switch jobs, careers, like every five years now. Vocational uncertainty all over the place. Wars and rumors of wars, this is like, turn on the TV and that's what you'll see. Financial anxiety, I paid $6.09 for gas this week because I was farther away from the city and that's all there was. That would have been unthinkable a little while ago. Medical diagnoses, one of my dearest friends, Walter, and he's made this public now, been diagnosed with multiple myeloma out in West Virginia and had uh, doctors say, you know, you, you just a very little short period of time. How do you face these things? Conflicted relationships and loneliness. When we're facing these things, we need the hope that these people had in the book of Revelation. So let's look at Revelation 12, 10 through 11. We're about ready to have lunch, by the way. So if this is getting too heavy, we're going to just go have fun in a little while. <laughs> then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Did the people in the Civil War think that a sword was going to go flying through the air? No, it was apocalyptic expression of pain. God wasn't up there in some bucket of grapes trampling out things. It was a way of expressing the wrath of God that was coming against the people that were doing the things that they were doing. I love this. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. The United States offered the leader of Ukraine free passage to the United States and asylum. We were going to pick him up, bring him back, and safely bring him to America. And he said, I don't need a ride. I need ammo. <laughs> Which I think is really cool. That is hope-filled thinking. Please hear me. I'm not trying to be political here. I don't understand the situation over there. I have, it's very complicated, but that's cool. I'm staying here. I'm not going to go find a safer place. I'm going to stick this out, and we're going to win this thing. Whether he wins this thing or not, he believes it. He believes it. He happens to be Jewish, by the way. Who thinks Jewish people have gone through a lot? And stick it out. I don't need a ride. I need ammo. Because the truth is, dictators and oppressors, Romans, Russian armies, the use of force is never sustainable. You can't continue to make people do things they don't want to do. The chariots of the Pharaoh always end up at the bottom of the Red Sea. You see that there on the right, the chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. That's the main storyline of the Old Testament, by the way. Pharaoh will die, so hang in there. Bottom left is Hitler's bunker. He thought he could impose his will on people. It's not sustainable. Hope is sustainable. And when people are facing nasty stuff around the world, when Christians are being persecuted in Nigeria and Indonesia and other places, their hope is sustainable. The people, the people oppressing them are not. The Pharaoh always ends up at the bottom of the sea. It's just a matter of time until we defeat all the pharaohs. Because guess who's king? The Lord is king, and they're not. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's not some shoots and ladders thing showing us some roadmap of things are going to happen wherever. It is a book about making it and surviving and being faithful and trusting the truth that the Pharaoh will die. The bottom left is Hitler's bunker. Here's this powerful guy. Shot himself in the head and he was burned with gasoline. That always will happen to everyone trying to impose force long term. 
Next week, we talk about the great white throne judgment. And it's even cooler than this week, so do not miss it. Come back for that. Let's pray for our lunch, and we're going to go out and eat. Lord, we pray a blessing on our time together. We pray a blessing on our, our fellowship. Lord, we're gathering here to break bread with people of hope. Everyone we break bread with today, Lord, is facing some kind of battle, whether it's with their kids, with their finances, with their health, with whatever it is they're facing, whatever insecurities we face, Lord. And we pray that you'd connect us in faith. I pray, Lord, that if nasty times are coming, we'd be so grounded in this book that we would overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Bless this food, Lord. And give us the blessing of studying this book. We're going to find stuff in this book we, none of us, including me, knows at this point. You're going to show us. And it's going to make a huge difference in all of our lives. Perhaps you're preparing us for a time to come where we're going to need these things. In any case, Lord, this hope will inspire us to get through this bad stuff we're going through. And it will give us solidarity with other people who are facing real persecution. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless this church as we move into our 17th year. And we pray, Lord, we'd be better at saying, as Kim was singing, Lord, come. That we would open our hearts to receive the king. For all of the other kings and rulers of the world, Lord, are imposters compared to him. He will have his way. Your son, Lord, will have his way with his creation. For he alone is king and Lord of all. And we pray for the blessing that comes from this book and letting some of that prevailing, nevertheless, faith of John who wrote it rub off on all of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're having.